Romans 11 Paul said something about powerful and, and the mysterious incredibly powerful about the uh, remnant of Israel there's not a, a lot of respect for the nation of Israel um, <laughs> in the different sectors of the world while the uh, I would say the dispensationalism have far more respect for Israel than the uh, covenantal community Christianity which is the uh, covenant theology by the reform world I'm of the covenant theology uh, from Romans 11 it is indefensible to write of Israel saying that the land doesn't belong to Israel and all this Romans 11 God's Paul writes very very clearly about the uh, about the place and the call of Israel so uh, to the extent Paul writes let me read it better again uh, Romans 11 verse 11 again I asked did this stumble so as to fall beyond recovery not at all rather because of their transgression or sin salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious <laughs> this is a double-edged sword did God what do you call that bring the salvation to Gentiles to make Israel uh, envious per se it's a double-edged sword because it's, it's two ways is God doing that and also Israel hardened in their own hearts too you know I was so blessed by Carson's commentary about about that Israel God did not harden Israel's hearts uh, solely but Israel hardened their own hearts it's in conjunction it's a mystery you know it's it's this far of scholarship that I have understood I've read that's probably one of the best ways to look at it you know it's like Romans 1 God handed them over to uh, to depravity to greater sins and etc but that didn't happen until they themselves deny the existence of God when they denied God they you know the existence of God in the, in the nature of creation God handed them over you know so it works double its sword so Paul is saying Romans 11 that because of the sins or transgression of the trespasses means riches for the world I think it uh, New Living Translation all right now the Gentiles were enriched okay they were disobedient the Jewish people were disobedient so God made salvation available to the Gentiles <laughs> that is almost like the only reason God gave the salvation to the Gentiles is because the Jews disobeyed but that's not the case that is only part of the story that is true but the other part of the story is the, the Jewish people Israel actually disobeyed God it's obvious read the book of the, the Gospels how the Jewish people the Pharisees especially rejected Christ as the Messiah as the Son of God and even to the extent of killing him on the cross all right crucified him so carry on verse 11 but God wanted his own people to become jealous and claim for themselves now if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation think how much greater blessing the world would share when they finally accept it finally they will accept it so that's you got to give space for Israel we got to believe God for the return of the Jewish people to the 12 tribes of Israel to the the overall tribe of believers in Christ there's no more 12 tribes of Israel well 12 tribes of Israel yes but in the in the kingdom of God in under Christ there's no 12 tribes so one tribe let's go Jesus tribe okay so they will be grafted in okay now since their rejection meant that God offers salvation to the rest of the world their acceptance be more beautiful okay let's skip that one um, so so ah right so now you have received the blessing God promised Abraham's children sharing the rich nourishment from the root 
of uh, God's root, all right? You do not support the root, okay? NIV says this. If some of the branches have been broken up and you, though a wild olive should have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. The root supports you. Don't ever forget that. Christendom comes from the legacy of the Old Testament, which is basically Israel. Okay? You know, God already thought about the Gentiles. As God promised Abraham, which is the beginning of the Jewish nation, okay, Israel, that God will make Abraham to be a blessing to all nations. God didn't say God will make Abraham to be a blessing to one nation called Israel. No, it threw in the nation of Israel. Israel, the seed of Israel, become a blessing to all the nations of the world. And who is that seed? That seed is the son of David, son of Joseph and Mary, son of God himself, Jesus Christ. That's how it's been dealt with. That's how it was fulfilled. You know, truly, God never meant the eternal blessings to be restricted to, to Abraham's natural descendants. But rather, that, that Abrahamic covenants to all nations. Alright, so, okay, so they were not broken off. They were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but, be, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. So you see here, consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Now, this is the one I want to pick up. There is the kindness of God. There's also the severity of God, or the sternness of God. God is kind, but God is also severe. He can take actions, and He does take actions, and He has taken actions. You know, the world thinks that the, we serve a wishy-washy God, like anything goes, but that's not true. He will not tolerate sins and uh, depravity. He will not. That's why the whole concept, that's why there's hell. That's why, that's why there's the cross. That's why the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has to bleed on the cross and be crucified and be killed. That's very severe. And praise God, He rose from the dead. He was resurrected from the dead three days later. All right, all these are great things happening. God is very kind, but God is severe. You know, so, so that the balance is, is the harmony of the two. You can't say, you cannot preach God is severe only. The judgment of God is said. No, he's also very kind. The compassion and the grace of God. He died for us, his love for us. He says, sin no more. He said, Father, he, he, Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's kindness. That's extreme radical kindness. All this combined defines who God is, the severity and the kindness of God. Otherwise, you'll be cut off. Okay? If they do not persist in unbelief, verse 23, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. God can graft the Israelites back in again. There's a notion that, you know, right now, there is no special place for Israel. By the history of Israel, as a chosen nation before, regardless of their rejection of who Christ is now, and since 2,000 years ago, it doesn't change the fact that God has a special place for Israel to come back. That's the mystery of God, which I'll read to you later on. But I just, have, I just want to say in this short video, uh, and teaching here that God is able to bring them back 
If you will cut out the olive tree that's wild by nature and contrary to nature will grow up in a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily would this the natural branches be grafted in? So Paul keeps contrasting. We are the wild branches. We're the unnatural branches. Israel is the natural, natural, original branches. But it's no big deal really because God used that through by His grace. There's nothing special about Israel that God chose them. That is already so clear in Israel. God did not choose them because they're a greater nation. In fact, they were the smallest nation. It's purely by the grace of God. In the overall scheme of things, you know, there is no greater or lesser. But at the time of God's creation, the overall us plan of God, God has chosen to use one nation, one kingdom, Israel, through the descendants of Abraham, to bless and change the world. And that has culminated in Christ Jesus, that through that has been transitioned into the church. The church becomes the blessing to the whole world. No more Israel, that's for sure. But Israel will become part of the church, the elect, you see, the descendants of Christ. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be considered. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles have come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. My goodness, this is mystery. Israel has experienced partial hardening. Now, that's where causes come to really help me a lot. They did not get hardened because God hardened them, but rather they hardened themselves together. You know, they, at the one side, they hardened themselves, and the other side, God hardened them. It goes hand in hand, and both are hardened. So this is what's happened. Israel has chosen to harden themselves. Look at, look at when Jesus was presented before Pontius Pilate. Pilate wants to release him. But Israel, the Pharisees, Jews, and stirred up the entire mob of Jews at that time, say, kill him, kill him. They wanted the Son of God to be killed. And many of them has already witnessed the miracles of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000 men, and another 5,000 women and children not counted at that time and walking on the water and all and racing of the cripple opening eyes of the blind and all this stuff and yet they say kill him my friends this is what you call hardening hardening of hearts is the scariest thing in the world there's no way out unless the grace of God comes in the person when we pray for our loved ones, our family, our friends to come to Christ, and they're not responding, they're not opening up because their hearts are hardened. Another way of looking at it is, I think Paul wrote, their eyes were, were blinded. The power, the power of Satan cut, blinded their eyes. I don't know why God allows so much power for the devil to work in that sense. But God is also working powerfully on the other side. We Christians are really caught in between the two, the struggles of the two kingdoms, and we are part of we are part of God's kingdom. Uh, therefore, we are in war with the kingdom of darkness, the satanic kingdom. That we know. So God wants us to really be freed from the kingdom of darkness, power of Satan, to fully the power of God. Okay, a full number of the Gentiles is coming, and all Israel will be saved. Basically, the full number of Israel will come in. It seems to me that there's a full number of Gentiles. How many people is going to be saved? It's a real predetermined, pre-known, you know. And then, the, and then the full number of the Jewish people to be saved as well. Okay, verse 15 says, as it is written, the deliverer will come of Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins. My gosh, God. See, this is what say, God say. 
The deliverer will come from Zion. Who is that? Jesus Christ. He's the deliverer. Where does he come from? Zion. Which, what is Zion? The city of God. Established at David. Naturally, by physical descent. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is a great, great, great grandson of David. Trace it back. He traces his descendants from Jesus. You see, and therefore, therefore, you know, the deliverer, Jesus, came from Zion. He would turn godlessness away from Jacob. Now, this is big. That means God, Jesus, would turn away godlessness from Jacob. Who is Jacob? The people of Israel. Spiritually, who is Jacob? The people of the church of Jesus Christ. We can turn away. You know, the thing that plagued us, blinded us, all this is godlessness. Godlessness. One second, it's very noisy here. Let me get past here. Okay. Right. This is New York City. So noisy. Bear with me. We'll be done now. Okay. We'll be done shortly. Okay, so. So the promise, the prophetic promises, God would turn godlessness away from Jacob. God would turn godlessness away from mercy. And this is the God's covenant with us when He take away our sins. How does Jesus turn away godlessness from us? By His death on the cross. There's the beginning. There's the beginning of the watershed event. Watershed event that turned the tide all the way through. That's why crucifixion of Christ is so very important. That's why the dying of, of the Son of God on the cross is so very important. Only after He died on the cross. No, not enough. Only after He resurrected from the cross and rose from the dead. Then was He able to turn our godless, godlessness away. That's the grace of God. That's by the power of the Spirit of God. A conviction of our hearts, of our sins. You know, we must bring in the teaching of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit more and more. The grace of God is outflowing richness from the sacrifice, the redemption work of Christ. But the one who brings all this and convicts us and changes, turn our way, our godlessness is the Holy Spirit working through the sufferings and resurrection of the body of Christ Jesus. Okay, so, so, okay, so, we receive mercy. Let me finish here. Verse 30, 33. All oh, the depth and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. The depth and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. The wisdom and how unsearchable beyond tracing out that is who our God is people think that you can go easy without knowing theology it's it's being naive you need to study theology the word of God to even begin to come close to the depth and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God all right so who has known the mind of the Lord who has seen his counsel Who's ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him, through him, and for him are all things. To him be the God, be the glory forever and ever. Amen.